Hello all, welcome back to more physical science. After having a week of review and exam, it's time to get back into new material and I'm going to jump into chapter five. Before we do start chapter five though, I always like to talk a little bit about the exam, what happened and whatnot. Um, I'm not going to go through the solutions of the exam. If you want to see the solutions, I post them on Banco Hall. And I, when I graded, I marked why I took off points for everything I took off points for. If you want a more detailed version of that, come talk to me, make an appointment, or come to my office hours. I will gladly go through things. But in general, on the exam, the highest score was a 95, and the average was a 73.4. Of note, that average is not including people who got a zero. Um, no one took the exam and got a zero. All of the zeros are people who just didn't take the exam. Um, why that happened, I changes from person to person, but yeah. So the average is 73, which is about where I normally expect it to be. If you want the whole grade breakdown, it looks like this. Um, of note, six people got in between a 90 and 100 on the exam, so that is really good. Um, but then two people got between a 30 and a 40, so that's not so good. That is now part of your grade. As of now, this exam is actually like half of your grade because half of your score in the class is exams. It's just going to be split between multiple exams. It's the only exam you have so far. With that in, the grades in the class look like this with the average in the class being a 77. I'm pretty happy with that. I will point out uh, three of you have between a 25 and a 35. If you're one of those three people, you're probably going to want to meet with me, figure out what you can do to get your grade back up. And no one cares about the number grade, though. The actual letter grades look like this. Um, so it's a pretty good well, it's, not, it's a kind of weird distribution, kind of just flat, except for B plus and B minus. But that's the grades in the class. Um, yeah, there they are. Uh, any questions about the exam, the class, or things like that before I start chapter five? Okay. I'll take that as a no, being that no one said anything. Um, seems like a logical reason to take it as a no. And I will move on. Uh, oh, I will say, um, I do want to make one comment at the exam. Some people did complain about a lack of time. Obviously, many of you had, didn't have an issue with time because, you know, a bunch of people did real fucking good. When you're doing open note things, Normally, th exams take longer if you're opening up every piece of notes and homework and example problems and everything. Be prepared. Have every ha Make yourself an equation sheet. Have a page in front of you with everything you need so that you're not, but minimize how much. If you're spending a lot of time on the exam, flipping through every single notes, every single everything, you aren't going to have enough time. And that's on purpose. If I give infinite time and open notes, you'll eventually get it all because you'll just find it online eventually. Um, be prepared for it more than that. Know that you have the time limit. 15 minutes to do the exam, 15 minutes to upload. That's going to be the same on the next exam. Be prepared for it and know what you're getting into. And, you know, make sure you upload things on time. Okay. Time management is important. Otherwise, chapter five. Chapter five is actually leaving the idea of what is classically called physics one or mechanics. And we're going to stop doing like physical things moving around and get into other branches of physics and then moving on to other branches of chemistry. And we're going to talk about in this chapter the idea of temperature and heat. Temperature, you got a pretty good idea of what it is but it's probably more complicated than you think. And heat, on a physics standpoint, most of you probably actually aren't too familiar with. And let's just start with temperature. Temperature is kind of an interesting thing because people define values for temperature. You know, it is, it's about 68 degrees in the room. Wow, that's what the heat's on too high. But it's about 68 degrees in this room. I thought that should be set to 67, but whatever. Um, 
like people understood that. But what temperature actually is, what is the difference in physics wise between hot and cold is something that took a long time for people to understand. And the idea is, is what temperature is, is the kinetic energy of the particles that make up a thing. Cold objects, the particles inside are slowly moving. And hot objects are whizzing around really, really, really fast. That's what temperature is. In fact, it's a very straightforward equation that the kinetic energy of a molecule is three halves a constant times the temperature. Now, many different systems have been developed for temperature. Uh, Fahrenheit is probably the one you're most familiar with. Celsius is probably the one you hear other people use because the metric version. And Kelvin is probably one you're the least familiar with, though debatably the most important. In general, comparing it to water, water freezes at 32 Fahrenheit, boils at 212 Fahrenheit, freezes at zero Celsius, boils at 100 Celsius, and freezes at 273 Kelvin and boils at 373 Kelvin. And the thing is, these temperature scales were made before people understood what temperature was. And so it was just kind of like, well, I'll get into this history of each of these units in a little bit. But yeah, these scales were made without knowledge of what temperature was, which kind of does some weird thing, makes them kind of weird with units and makes us have to do unit conversions differently. Now, if we want to measure temperature, the most classic way with a old school thermometer, like the picture at the bottom, uses something called thermal expansion. And here's the idea. Nearly all substances, there's very, very, very few exceptions, get bigger when they get hotter. That if you increase the temperature of something, it will grow. If you decrease the temperature of something, it will shrink. This is why if you take a can and put it in the, oh, sorry, a jar, put it in the fridge, close it and put it in the fridge, it's hard to open again. It's because it literally shrank. And different things shrink at different rates. Metal shrinks faster than glass, so it sucks and right on. Old school thermometers like the one at the bottom, that's how they work, is that as it gets temperature, it grows. And as it grows, it goes up the tube. Um, it's just a substance made that has a night that's a very calculable amount, traditionally mercury or not the model ones, alcohol. But that's the idea. You heat something up, it will get bigger with very few exceptions. Um, this is also so classical thermometers, like the one there, that's how they work. Um, a thermometer with a dial, on the other hand, uses something called a bimetallic strip, which is kind of interesting. And here's the general idea. How much something grows as a function of temperature is based off the material. That, going back to the glass gel, glass will get a little bit smaller when it gets cold. Metal will get a lot smaller when it gets cold. Once again, where you put a glass gel with a metal top, put it in the fridge, it gets so hard to open, is because the metal top will so shrink down on. A bimetallic strip, and the bimetallic strip in this picture is right here. A bimetallic strip is two pieces of metal glued together and two different types of metal that will grow differently with temperature. And what you'll find is if you take a bimetallic strip and mess around with its temperature, it'll start to bend. The reason for this bend, and let's just take my bimetallic strip, is because different metals will grow different amounts. And so the one metal will grow longer than the other metal. So I'm just putting this on a hot plate set to 500 degrees. And if the one metal grows longer than the other one, it'll cause this coil. And so when I heat this up, you can see this whole thing is starting to get a bend in it. Um, as I said, this is, yeah, so now it has a pretty good bend. This is how any dial thermometers work. If I then take this and put it in the ice water, It'll shrink again, but they'll shrink to back to where they will, and it becomes straight. That it no longer has the curve in it. Heat it back up, the bend will come back. Any questions though? This is the basis kind of, well not the bottom, but the idea that if you heat something up, it gets bigger of what is called a Galileo thermometer. This is a Galileo thermometer. I don't know how many of you have seen them before. They consist of little bubbles of various liquids 
suspended a tube, and from each one, let's see if I can tone this out so you can read it, there's a little Malko hanging saying what temperature it corresponds to. And what it will be is wherever there's a gap, right now it's right here, the temperature is between those two things. That I can see that this one says 72 is floating, this one that says 68 is sinking, so the temperature must be between 68 and 72. Once again, it's a little woman here, apparently. The reason that happens is density decides whether or not something floats. And if the size of something changes with temperature, that means the volume of something changes with temperature. That the volume of these liquids in these little bulbs will get bigger or smaller with temperature, bigger when hotter, smaller when colder. But the thing is, mass does not change. And since density is mass over volume, that means density changes as a function of temperature. And what this does is the different liquids are set so that as the density changes with temperature, it'll change whether they sink or float. And so if this gets hot, more of these will drop down. If it gets cold, more of them will rise up. It's just using the idea that things change the size with temperature. Any questions there? I'm trying to heat this up even more so we can get another one to drop. OK, um, kind of interesting things. This is something in like engineering. If you got something that's going to heat up, you got to plan for that. Take, for example, jets. The SL-71 Blackboard at its max speed, which is Mach 3, three times the speed of sound, it is a foot longer than when it's stationary. It's a foot longer because the outside of this thing heats up. And as it heats up, it grows. And so you need to plan for it. Plan for it because if you don't allow it to grow, it will break. The Concorde jet becomes 18 inches longer at its max speed. Uh, these numbers here, 5.2 times 7, 6, 23 times 7, 6, this is called the coefficient of thermal expansion. That's just a coefficient to deal with how much it expands. I'm not going to do this mathematically. I'm just going to talk about it. And so these jets literally grow longer when they go full speed because a friction in the air heats them up. And as they get hotter, they get bigger. It's something we need to plan for. This is also why bridges, like in the bottom right, have those teeth. It's because on a hot day, the bridge will get bigger. On a cold day, the bridge will get colder or get smaller. And so you, it's so it can get bigger and smaller. So when you go over a bridge, the the dump, the dump, the dump thing is because if you don't allow for it, if the and the bridge tries to get bigger or smaller and there's no allowing for it, it'll just buckle. Likewise, train tracks are built with gaps between each metal rail. So when it gets hot, when they get longer, that they can stretch. If you do not account for it, if you do not plan for it, the metal will buckle. This picture on the left is train tracks that were laid and some people didn't give enough space for thermal expansion. Because it didn't have enough space for thermal expansion, it just and crumpled because it will get bigger on hot days and will get smaller on cold days. Questions? Now, there is an exception to this. Most everything, when it gets hotter, it gets big. There are very few exceptions, but one of the exceptions happens to be waddle. Waddle from four degrees Celsius and up gets bigger as it gets hotter. But waddle between four degrees Celsius and down goes the opposite. Anytime water is lower than four degrees, the volume goes up as temperature decreases. This is due to the strength of chemical bonds. That's really a full thing for a chemistry class. But uh, this is why ice floats. Ice is one of, or water is one of the only things that its solid form floats in its liquid form. It's actually really goddamn weird that ice floats. Anything else, if you have like solid lead and liquid lead, the solid lead will sink. Um, that's going to be like everyone else. But yeah, ice floats because it breaks this down. That everything, most everything else, the hotter you get, the bigger you get, except waddle from four degrees and below. Uh, fun fact, this fact that ice floats is really goddamn important. 
Um, if ice didn't float, ice would sink to the bottom of the ocean, and ice would start collecting at the bottom of the ocean. And if you, they would slowly fill the ocean with ice. And if you slowly fill the ocean of ice, that's basically going to keep the planet from distributing heat around it. And you would have a permanent ice age on the planet. So ice floating, very good. There wouldn't be life on the planet without it. But it's um, kind of weird. Now, oh, I forgot to show another video. Um, now, I'm talking about things that are just getting longer. Really, most things, when they heat up, they get bigger in all directions. They don't just get longer, but just grow. Um, to give you an example of this, my mouse keeps disappearing. What I have here is a metal sphere that's in this hot thing to heat it up. And it's heated to about 500 degrees Celsius and a metal hoop. If I take it, it does not fit in the metal hoop. If I decrease the temperature, by decreasing the temperature, I decrease the size of that ball. And when I decrease the temperature, uh, fit a little better, now I could fit it on and get it stuck. I'm going to make a little codal. There you go. Now with ease, once I fix that. Now it goes in off with the ease. That's because it literally became smaller when I cooled it down. Okay. Now, modern devices, we very seldom measure temperature using thermal expansion. These days, like if you, we can measure temperature with digital devices, or, you know, just those things they aim and point at you and they tell you the exact temperature of your head by like pointing something at you without touching you. The general idea is digital thermometers use various things. Digital thermometers that touch an object, like a meat thermometer to the right, or like an in-ear thermometer to the left. Um, oh, sorry, those are different. The one like the in-ear thermometer to the left, which would be the same as the ones where you stand and point at someone and measure the temperature from a distance, which I should add a photo of one of those in. That's kind of a newer thing. They measure the thermal radiation off a thing. They look at how much heat radiates from an object. We're going to talk about thermal radiation later on, but no, um, I think actually on Wednesday. Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. But all things radiate heat, and they just measure the heat that radiates off. More other digital thermometers that involve contact, like the meat thermometer, they look at electrical resistance. That in a circuit, resistance varies with temperature. What that means, we'll get to later when we talk about resistance. But for now, just know that it will affect, yeah, resistance. So that's how temperature is measured. That's what's happening. Let's actually get into the units for temperature, though. And the main two units are Celsius and Fahrenheit. Now, Fahrenheit was defined based off the freezing point and boiling point of a saltwater brine. And the numbers don't really correspond to anything you'd normally be using. But really, what it was was, OK, 0 Celsius was when the saltwater brine froze. 100 Celsius was when it boiled. But really, the base of Celsius is supposed to be what it feels like. That 0 is really goddamn cold. 100 is really goddamn hot. 50 is eh, somewhere in the middle. That's the basis of Fahrenheit, is that it's supposed to match where humans live. Most of the world, though, does not use Fahrenheit. Most of the world uses Celsius, which is based off water. And water, very important for life. And there's a lot of it on the planet. Water is kind of important. And it's based off the idea that zero degrees is when ice, when water freezes. And 100 degrees is when water boils. We are, for, we are going to mostly work in Celsius. And in this class, yeah, we're going to always use Celsius, actually. Well, not always. We'll get back to why not always a second. Because going back to the idea that America is one of three countries that don't use Celsius. Science is international community. Go back to chapter one where I talked about this. So we're going to work in Celsius and ignore Fahrenheit, which although kind of matches how people feel, this is science. We don't give a shit about how you feel about things. We just want cold hard facts. 
Okay. Now, the diff issue is, if you want to convert between like feet and meters, zero is zero in length. Zero feet equals zero meters. But for temperature, because people define temperature, not really understanding what temperature was, you know, they're like, oh, this feels hot, this feels cold, but they don't understand the ca that there was molecules moving, or even what molecules were at the time, that the zero points are off. The fact that zero degrees Celsius equals 32 Fahrenheit. And because of this, doing a unit conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit has its own rules that do not match the normal unit conversions. And so instead of a normal unit conversion where we just multiply by a ratio to cancel out some units, we're going to have equations for these calculations. Where TF and TC will stand for Celsius temperature and Fahrenheit temperature, respectively. Oh, side note, capital T is temperature. We've used a lot of T for time in the past, but time is lowercase t. Capital T will be temperature. And what these say is how to get from Celsius to Fahrenheit or from Fahrenheit to Celsius. If you have a temperature in Celsius and you want it in Fahrenheit, you just use this temperature, this equation, I mean. You'll multiply by 9 fifths and then add 32. If instead you have a temperature in Fahrenheit and you want it in Celsius, you use this equation, where you will subtract 32. And then after you subtract 32, multiply by 5 ninths. Here's the thing, though. Celsius is more common. And based off water, water is important, but it's still kind of arbitrary. There's a lot of compounds and chemicals and things in the world, and not all of them are water. In fact, a large percentage aren't water. And so why is water so special? Why do we base zero off when water freezes, when there's everything else in the world? That brings us to our third temperature scale, known as Kelvin. Now, first thing we'll say about Kelvin is you don't have degrees Kelvin. So they can be degrees Celsius or degrees Fahrenheit. You do not have degrees Kelvin. It's just Kelvin. And the reason why is it's not in degrees. It's an absolute scale. You see, Kelvin is the one that's based off what's actually happening and based off actual science. You see, I said before that temperature is based off the kinetic energy of molecules, how fast they're whipping around. Kelvin is based off so that zero Kelvin means zero movement. And zero Kelvin, also known as absolute zero, is when the kinetic energy of a particle is zero. It's when all the particles are perfectly stationary and not moving. This is the coldest possible temperature. Space is like three Kelvin due to ambient radiation. So even that isn't all the way down to zero. It is, it is only a theoretical temperature. Zero Kelvin has never been leased. We've gotten close. Um, what my research when I was in grad school was done at full Kelvin. At that temperature, oxygen is a solid, which is a real fucking issue. But I had a friend who had worked at super low temperatures and was going down to millikelvin, so 0 0.001 Kelvin. We've gotten colder than that, though. Now, the basis of Kelvin as a unit is people said, you know what? Everyone likes metric. Let's use Celsius and just fix the zero. And that's the idea of Kelvin. Kelvin has the same size steps as Celsius. If you take something that's 20 degrees Celsius and bring it to 30 degrees Celsius, the temperature went up 10 degrees Celsius. That is an increase in 10 Kelvin. The size of a step is the same. It's just fixing the zero. And the conversion between Celsius and Kelvin is that zero Kelvin equals negative 273 Celsius. And so to convert between Kelvin and Celsius, you simply add or subtract 273. To go from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you add 273. To go from Kelvin to Celsius, you subtract 273. Now, for the most part in, the, in this class, if you always work in Kelvin, you will be fine. But we will have equations you can work in Celsius. And the reason why is this idea that what, of Kelvin and Celsius conversion. Any equation that has a change in temperature 
or a T final minus T initial. You can use Celsius or Kelvin because they'll be the same. But if the equation just has a T, you got to work in Kelvin. And I'll cover this more as I go through the various equations, which ones you can do Kelvin, which ones you can't. Okay. Any questions? Guess not. Okay, let's do an example problem. But I'm trying to keep this as interesting as I can. Example problem doing, you know, temperature. So I made it more complicated than it needed to be. The book Fahrenheit 451 is written by Wade Bradbury and is based off the temperature which paper burns, which makes sense in the comments of the book. Wade Bradbury, though, is an American author. Hence, he used Fahrenheit. Let's say Ray Bradbury was, I don't know, we'll go Canadian. And therefore worked in metric. What would the name of the book be? Which is an overly complicated way of saying, let's convert 451 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius. If you want to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius, do not just do conversions like we've done in the past. Pull out those equations I gave earlier. You can go back a few slides and see that I said that the temperature in Celsius is 5 ninths, the te temperature in Fahrenheit minus 32. And to do this, what you'll do is you'll just plug in TF with the value you started with. We'll say TF is 451. And you'll go through the steps. 451 minus 32. 451 minus 32 is 419. And I'll take 419 and I'll multiply by 5 and divide by 9, which I'm just going to round that to 233. And so 451 Fahrenheit, or Fahrenheit 451, if I want to do it like the book, is 233 degrees Celsius, or Celsius 233, if I want to stick to the book. OK? Now, if I wanted that number in Kelvin, if I want that number in Kelvin, I just, how do I find Kelvin? You say Celsius plus 273, 273.15 if you want to be more exact. And so I say, okay, I have 233 Celsius. If I want that in Kelvin, it'll be 233 plus 273 or 506. Those are like not lined up well. And so the book would be Kelvin 506 or 506 Kelvin. Why do I wait for questions? I'm just going to line these up because that was really bothering me. Good enough. Not good enough, but I'll fix it later. Any questions? All right, I want to make sure you guys are paying attention and this is making sense. You, hit, you heat a temp something from 15 degrees to 35 degrees Celsius. What is the change in Kelvin? I'm um, in class, I would have raised hands. I'm not going to bother with a poll in this just for this little question. If you want to find the change in temperature in Kelvin, it's only going to be 20. Because the change in temperature, the temperatures aren't the same. 15 degrees Celsius, adding 273, 273 to, is 288 Oops, Kelvin. 35, 273, 78, 9, 10 is 308 Kelvin. But if I subtract those, you still get 20. When doing a change in temperature, it's fine to work in Celsius because the conversion is just adding a number. So they will be the same on either side. Okay. Now, I keep saying temperatures related to how fast molecules are moving. So it's probably good to start talking about this in energy terms. You see, the internal energy of an object is how much energy a molecule or atom has. And once again, it's directly based off how fast it's moving. It goes to the equation 3 halves Boltzmann's constant times t. Well, we'll cover Boltzmann's constant in a little bit. Uh, the faster, the, the harder something is, the faster the molecules move, the more energy it has. There's also a type of potential energy involved here. 
uh, that's going to be based off the bonds holding it together. We'll talk about that when we hit chemistry. And so hot things have more energy than cold things, at least internal energy. But for the most part, we're very seldom going to deal with how much internal energy an object has. Like I can say, the water in, I just flung water. The water in here is probably room temperature, or it's probably cold room temperature. It's probably like, because this is from the fridge, it's probably like 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I could say how much energy is in there. But most part, we don't care about that. We, oh, it's not actually that cold. We care about when we start heating things up or cooling things down. That's normally more important. And this gets into the idea of heat. Anytime you take a hot thing and a cold thing and put them together, they will try to equalize energies. That all things want to have the same amount of internal energy. And so this gets into the idea of the heat death of the universe, but that's a whole nother story. And so if you take water and put ice in it, the ice heats up, the water gets colder. That's because it wants to have the same temperature. And what it is is energy always flows from more to less. When you put ice in a drink, the ice, what the mechanism isn't the ice cooling the drink. The mechanism is actually the drink heating the ice. And temperature flows from hot to cold. But if the, 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 the drink heats up the ice, it's going to lose energy because energy can't be created or destroyed. And when you put a hot and cold thing together, like ice in a drink, what's going to happen is that they'll, that energy will shift from the hot thing to the cold thing until they both have the same amount of energy. And we would define the transfer of energy, the change of energy, or the change in thermal energy as heat. You see, a few chapters ago, we talked about work. And by first you me last chapter. Work was change in mechanical energy. Final energy minus initial energy. Heat is change in thermal energy. Final thermal energy minus initial thermal energy. Well, heat uses the symbol Q. Why is heat a Q? No idea. But heat is Q. Just deal with it. Capital Q. And it's the change in thermal energy. Anytime something changes temperature or phase. Now, since heat is energy, it's measured in joules. Um, that's the unit. The American version of joules, and it's really only used for this type of heat. It's very, very seldom used in heat, any type of energy, is the calorie. And you're probably familiar with calories because food, right? You eat this thing, that's so many calories in it. That's just saying how much internal energy it has that your body can turn into, you know, you moving. Oh, well, kind of. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, a, one calorie is defined as 4.186 joules. This is actually an American unit. It actually is a metric unit. It's just complicated. We're not going to use it much. Uh, chemists use it a lot. Uh, a calorie is defined as the amount of heat needed to raise one gram of water one degree Celsius. Um, fun fact, though, food calories. When you talk about food calories, it is how much internal energy that thing has. Food calories, though, is not the same calories as this this is this is such one of the most bullshit things in science but food calories are spelled with a capital c and calorie with a capital c is 1000 calories with a lowercase c this is because if you're going to eat something and you're, you're told it has a thousand calories or you're going to eat something you're told it has one calorie one calorie sounds a lot better and so in a sheer marketing standpoint when we, as a society, made our definitions of how we were going to define the amount of energy in food, we opted to use the kilocalorie, where the kilocalorie is 1,000 calories. But kilocalorie is a mouthful. So in food, they just dropped the kilo and made it a capital C. And so food is measured in kilocalories, or calories with a capital C. And so if something says it has 800 calories, it has 800 calories capital C, Right? If the food has 800 calories, 
That's 888,000 calories. Yeah, it's dumb. But it makes you feel better about what you're eating. So that's the important thing, right? Uh, food, by definition, must be measured in kilocalories or calories with a capital C. You would never find anything measured in lowercase c that would go against um, regulations. Now, what we're going to be talking about is heat, which was, gets, uses Q, and I'm going to work in joules and not calories. No need for a new unit. If we add heat to something, we are going to increase its temperature. And if we take heat away from something, we are going to decrease its temperature. How much its temperature increases or decreases with as heat is added or taken away is going to be based off what is called the specific heat. And well, heat uses the symbol C. Sorry, heat uses the symbol Q. I misspoke. Specific heat uses the symbol C. And the specific heat, which has units of joules per kilogram degree Celsius, is a constant for any given material to say how readily it changes temperature. Things that can get hot or cold easily, like metal, have very low values of specific heat. Things that do not change temperature easily, water is actually a big one there, but something like styrofoam or air have very high values of specific heat. And it's just a way of saying how readily something can change temperature. It's a constant for any given compound. Well, I will give the values when they're needed. But it basically says how much heat is required to change the temperature. It's actually defined as the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance, one degree Celsius. Ooh, that's a typo. Uh, one kilogram of a substance, one degree Celsius. But um, just know it's a constant for the material and how easy it is to change its temperature. I mean, here's some values. So aluminum has a pretty low value at 900. Copper is even lower value at 387. This is why people use like copper pans. It readily can change temperature. Um, steel is also not on here, but steel is also very low. Water is stupid high at 4,186 joules per kilogram degree Celsius. Water has a very high specific heat, which is going to come into play. But of note, because this is important, specific heat of something does change with phase. If you note, we have water, steam, and ice. Water, steam, and ice do have different values of specific heat. Um, that's going to be important. We're going to come back to that fact. But for now, no, that is constant with phase, not with chemical composition. That H2O is all three of these, but they have different values. As I already said, water has a very high value. Um, it's actually really hard to change the temperature of water. This is, uh, it's, it takes a lot of energy. Um, this is why we use water to heat things often water heating or water cooling is because it's hard to change the temperature of water, uh, which is why it takes so long to boil water. Um, this is also why, why places that are coastal usually don't have huge changes in temperature. Like San Francisco, it's always 70. The reason why is because it's on the coast and there's a lot of water in the air, and so it doesn't change much. This is why like big lakes don't really ever freeze. Smaller ones will freeze eventually. It's because it takes a lot of effort to change the temperature of water. It's a super high value. I feel like this meme is probably way too dated and most of you don't remember who this guy is anymore, but whatever, I keep it here anyways. Now, to actually quantize this, to put math to all this shit, we can talk about how much heat is required to change the temperature of a substance. And the amount of heat required to change the temperature of a substance goes by this. Well, heat, which is capital Q, equals mc delta t, where the heat equals the mass times specific heat times the change in temperature, final temperature minus initial temperature. That is how much heat is required to change the temperature of any object. Um, mass will be measured in kilograms, c in 
joules per kilogram degree Celsius and temperature here, you can use Kelvin or Celsius. I'll normally use Celsius because it's just more common to get numbers in, but you can use either one. And this will say exactly how much heat is required to change the temperature of an object. Now, of note, this is a scalar. You don't have heat in a direction. It's not heat to the right. Ow, just elbow that. But this is one of the scalars that does can be negative. Anytime your final temperature is greater than your initial temperature, Q is positive. That means you add heat to change the temperature. But anytime your final temperature is less than your initial temperature, Q will be negative. That means you need to take heat away to change its temperature. But you can find the heat required to do things. Let's say, for example, I asked, how much heat does it take to heat 80 kilograms of bath water from 12 degrees to 42 degrees, which is about 54 to 108? This is like a bath full of water from cold to hot, basically. If you want to know the heat required to do this, the heat required will be MCT final minus T initial. You'll need the value of C. Once again, I would give that. And you would just say the heat required is the mass times C times the change in temperature. Well, you'll start by finding the change in temperature. If I'm going from 12 to 42, I'll take 42 minus 12. 42 minus 12 is 30. I can have some units cancel out. And I'll multiply through. 80 times 4186 times 30 is 1 times 10 to the 7th. And that is how much heat it would take to heat up this water. Questions? Okay, so let's say you got a hot thing of tea, and you make some hot tea, but you want iced tea. Well, you could either put cold water in it, or you can put ice in it. The end effect's going to be the same. If you put cold water in it, if you put ice in it, it's going to melt and dilute it anyways. But if you want to make it cold, you never put water in it. You put ice in it. It's more logical. That's because I'm ignoring something. See, this is the heat required to change the temperature of an object. But it also takes heat to change the phase of an object. A phase change is any time it goes from one of the three, or really four, phases to another type. That we, if we turn a solid into a liquid, that is called melting. And going a solid to a liquid will take heat. It takes, any time you go from solid to liquid, you're going to take heat. Think of it this way. If you got a solid piece of metal and you want to pour it into a mold, you heat it up enough to become liquid metal. That takes heat. Same ways to bring ice to water takes heat. You can also bring water to a gas that's called evaporation. That also takes heat. You can also go the opposite way, gas to a liquid. That's called condensation. That is going to release heat. Or liquid to ice, freezing. That is going to release heat. And so if you put ice into a drink, the ice melts. This is going to take heat. And what happens is it pulls that heat out of your drink. That if I put ice into some hot tea, the tea gets colder because the ice melting grabbed the energy inside the tea and took it for itself to change its face. Um, of note, you can do those of the straight jumps. You can go straight from ice to vapor. That is called sublimation. It's what um, dry ice does. Or you could do vapor to ice. That's called deposition. That's what freezer burn is in a fridge. But we're not going to talk about them. If you want to know how much energy it takes to not change the temperature, but change the phase, this uses something called the latent heat. Let's say you're going to boil a pot of water. You put a bottle of water on your stove and crank up the heat. The water is going to go and get hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter. And it's going to get hotter and hotter and hotter until it hits the boiling point where the boiling point for water is 100 degrees Celsius. Once the water hits 100 degrees Celsius, you can keep the pot on the stove. You keep the pot on the stove, you're going to keep adding heat in. But what happens is the water will not get hotter. That what will happen when the water boils is all of the heat you add will go to changing the phase. 
and the heat required to change the phase or the heat that's released when you change the phase if you're going from gas to liquid or liquid to solid. But the heat required to change the phase, which is still heat, so it's going to be Q, goes by this equation, Lm. And the heat required to change the phase something is the latent heat times the mass. With the latent heat, units of joules per kilogram, is just a constant for the material. And really, it's three constants, the heat of vaporization, the heat of fusion, and the heat of sublimation. We're never going to talk about sublimation, so you can skip it. That's when we talk about when we have things subliming. But the latent heat of vaporization is the constant you use if you're going from liquid to gas or gas to liquid. Vaporization, vapor. Vapor is gases. So yeah, liquid to gas or gas to, to liquid, that's the, we're going to use L sub V, latent heat of vaporization. The latent heat of fusion is any time you go solid to liquid or liquid to solid. And if you want to know the heat required to melt ice, if you want to melt ice, you're going from solid to liquid. The heat required to melt ice will be M times the latent heat of fusion. And what will happen is if you have a solid and you start adding heat, you can have both phase changes and temperature changes. Let's say I got a piece of ice at like negative five degrees Celsius and I add heat to it. If I take a piece of ice at negative five degrees Celsius and add heat, or this is even lower, this is negative 10, it's like negative 20 degrees Celsius. If I have ice at negative 20 degrees Celsius and add heat, is as I add heat, the, the temperature will go up and the temperature will increase to zero degrees. Once you hit zero degrees, the, the ice cannot get hot or add ice. Ice maxes out at zero degrees. And so any heat you add will not increase the temperature. It'll increase the phase. And it would make all of your ice into water. And you have to add a certain amount of heat, ml, to turn your wa ice to water. And eventually you get the point that all the water melts. Once all of the water is melted, you now have water at zero degrees. And if you want to change the temperature of your water, if you keep adding heat, now that it's all water, now it can get hotter again. Now you can increase the temperature using your Q equals MC T final minus T initial. And all heat you add will go to changing the temperature of the water, but only up to 100 degrees. Once it hits 100 degrees, water won't get any hotter. And any heat you get will go towards boiling the water until all of the water is boiled. And once all of the water is boiled, then you can change the temperature of the steam. In general, if you want to find the heat required to change the temperature of one object from one place to another, this will be your guide. That you'll have to use multiple equations and which equations will depend on what range you're doing. That there will be an equation for the change in temperature of a solid an equation for the change in temperature of a liquid, an equation for the change in temperature of a gas, but also an equation for each phase change. Now, I'm going to use this as an example, but probably not today because of time, but I want to say a little bit more about this. Um, latent heats are a constant for a material. You can look up what they are. Here is a series of latent heats. But we're only going to talk about water in this class. We're going to talk about water, which freezes at zero degrees and boils at 100. And we can talk about the latent heat of fusion of water and the latent heat of vaporization of water. And since we're only going to talk about water, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this chart and I'm going to say that for water, LF is a constant, LV is a constant, C, C, and C is a constant. And so full waddle, I can plug in those values. And full waddle, we can use this to find how much heat is required to change the temperature and phase of an object. And this would tell us that if we want to heat something from one temperature to another temperature, exactly how much heat is required. I'll try to usually keep this color coded to try to have it make sense. And I will be starting up with an example problem on how we use these equations, but it's 1250, so not today. I will pick up on Wednesday where I'll show you how to use these equations. Before I go, though, some other notes. So today is the 8th. 
Your next homework, your homework's to do Wednesday night. So logically, your next homework would be the 10th, which would be chapter five. But I just started chapter five, and I'm going to finish it Wednesday. There was no homework due this week, aka no homework due on the 10th, because of the fact I always give a week for the homework. So the homework for chapter five would be the 17th. You got a week off. This will always happen after exams. Also, no new material means I didn't open a new lab. I did not have a lab open on March 5th. There was no lab due this week, this week being the 12th, because the next lab is on this, and I haven't finished this. So this lab will open on Friday and be due on the 19th. But other than that, unless there's any questions, this is all that. Have a good day.